Can everybody in the back hear me all right? All right. This is so exciting. I was just talking to one of our younger members who was remembering that it was two years ago, uh, maybe three, uh, that we had our last procession in together as a congregation. So let's just give a little roar of applause here. Uh, we are looking, uh, I can hear the echo of us in there. You sound great inside the room, by the way. Um, the, uh, uh, we're, we're really excited that we can be worshiping this Holy Week. Uh, I want to remind you that on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, there are services uh, that are both at 11 and at 6.30 p.m. Uh, so you can come before noon or you can come. It's, do not come at 11 at night. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, and then on Easter, there are three worship services. Out here in the courtyard, we're going to have the early service at 7 o'clock. Uh, then uh, at 9 and 11, we're inside. Now, as you figured out, nine usually is the most crowded service, and you are certainly welcome to come. But if you're free to come to 11, it might be a little easier to get a seat. I do this every year to remind you because this is so important. You're going to see people that you see regularly. Like I see people that I talk to at the store over here at Moon Valley, uh, and I wish them a happy Easter. Uh, and then I say, hey, if you, if you need a place to go, if you're looking for a place to go on Easter, uh, you're welcome to come to my church. Uh, and uh, there are so many people who are on that sort of teeter-totter edge, right? Uh, and they're thinking and they kind of want to go, but they don't want to go through the hassle of being with strangers. Uh, and somehow an invitation from a friendly face makes all the difference in the world. So uh, look for that person who needs you to ask them. Uh, and be that blessing for them. Sherry would want to let me remind you that inside the door, you can save the church postage uh, by picking up your first quarter giving statements. Uh, so they're, they're all alphabetical in there, and you can grab those as well. What else we have? We have a beautiful uh, communication survey. If you find my announcements boring, this is a good time to fill out the survey. Um, we are still looking for volunteers uh, for, uh, to help us out uh, for uh, the different services we're having during Holy Week. And on the back side, if you'd like to uh, donate a lily, we would have that as well. Does everybody here have a palm? All right, if you see somebody without a palm, all these palms are splittable, so you can just tear them in half uh, and share it with your neighbor. Uh, but let's uh, begin now with a moment of, oh, thank you. A moment of silence uh, before we begin our worship service together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Son of the Son of Humble and riding on a donkey. We you. Acclaimed by crowds and caroled by children. Moving from the peace of the countryside to the corridors of power. We salute you, Christ our Lord. You are giving the beast of burden a new dignity. You are giving majesty a new face. You are giving those who long for redemption a new song to sing. With them, with heart and voice, we shout, Hosanna! The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice 
for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph to be acclaimed son of David and king of kings by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path. We pray you bless these branches and we who bear them that we may ever hail Jesus as our Lord and King and follow him with perfect confidence through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in peace.
let us pray together. Sovereign God, you have established your rule over the human heart through the servanthood of Jesus Christ. By your spirit, keep us in the joyful procession of those with their tongues confess Jesus as Lord and with their lives praise him as a savior, whom with you and the Holy Spirit we worship and praise, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who thought he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And in being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here we are, friends. The way of the wilderness, the way in the wilderness, is finally uh, coming to the gates of the city. And as I have shared in previous years as we've explored this scene together, it comes in kind of through the back gate. We remember that Pontius Pilate and his entourage are coming in to Jerusalem through the main gate with lots of fanfare. And, and meanwhile, this sort of parody of a parade is coming through on the other side of Jerusalem, this kind of fool's pageant. And there's a joyous abandon in this scene, but there's also a sense of elemental sighing from the depths of creation, of longing for redemption. And we discover in, in, in the way that Jesus presents himself in his commitment to carrying out the words of the prophet to embodying the text of, of scripture in his entrance into Jerusalem, that humility, humility itself is the gate. And even as people are shedding their outer garments and, and giving away in their most prized possession in some cases in order to make a way for him to come into the city, we are reminded that there's no way out of the wilderness without leaving something behind. Paul writes to the Philippians as a community trying to walk this way together and trying to get through the narrow gate as a group. If you've ever tried to get through a narrow space with a group of people, you, you know what the challenges can be. Toes are getting stepped on. There's a little bit of pushing and shoving. I go first. No, you go. I go first. I go first. So from his prison cell, Paul is calling out a warning. My friends, all those egos are not going to fit. Plus, they're going to make you easy targets for your opponents. If you want to keep on the way, you're going to need your, to lose some weight, and it's going to need to come off your minds. If you, want to get, if you want to keep on the way, you're going to need to lose your minds. Oh, no. Oh, no. But listen. Listen to the first four verses of, of chapter 2. This came right before the text we heard today. If, then, there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. 
Be of the same mind. He says it twice. Be of the same mind in full accord and of one mind. We might need to lose some weight off our minds to follow in the way of Jesus. Now, some of us are immediately going to say, uh-uh, in a way, I have seen religious people who have lost their minds. I have seen what they do. Some of us might fear this might, be, this might be the biggest reservation we have about religion, if we're realistic. Some of us fear that this is in, all intended to lull us in, into some kind of cultish groupthink, right? Where we, we lose our ability to discern and reason for ourselves, a sort of mob mentality. And we certainly have witnessed the dangers of that, right? Besides that, many of us feel very attached to our minds. We're quite fond of our thoughts. We're rather impressed by our judgments. We pride ourselves on our mental acuity, our good judgment. And when someone tells us we might need to let go of some of that, we might need to let go of a thought or a, a narrative or a mental attachment for the greater good, we become kind of like, you know, that person on the plane who's been asked to gate check their oversized carry-on because it just won't fit, but they're bound and determined to shove that thing in there anyway. And, Everybody's waiting. You know, you know, it's going to fit. It's not going to fit. It's going to fit. You need to take something out. I'm not taking anything out. I am very attached to these judgments and these worries that I've cultivated many a night and these opinions. If I take one out, they're all going to unravel. I'm not taking anything out of here. It's going to fit. I'm not handing any of this off. Others of us, when called upon to lighten our mental load, we'll say, <laughs> easy, done. Way ahead of you, pastor. Time for donuts yet? <laughs> but it's not as easy, my friends. It's not as easy as you might think. I want to invite especially the kids in the room to a special experiment. We're not going to come forward today, uh, but I'm going to invite you to, to be a part of an experiment. You guys want to be at a club? Who wants to be in a club? All right. When the, the, the author, Leo Tolstoy, was a kid, he formed a club with a couple of his buddies. And the way you could get into the club was by uh, standing in a corner for 30 minutes and not thinking about a white bear, okay? All you had to do was stand in the corner for 30 minutes and not think about a white bear. Okay, we don't have 30 minutes to do that, but we're going to try it for 30 seconds. Do you think you can not think about a white bear for 30 seconds? You can try this at home, too. Ready? I'm going to set a timer, and your job is going to be to not think about a white bear for 30 seconds. Now, if you think about a white bear in the next 30 seconds, I want you to just put a finger up, okay? And then you can move on and keep trying not to think of a white bear, but if you do, just put a finger up, okay? So we can kind of keep track of how this experiment goes. Okay, ready? Don't think about a white bear starting now. You doing good? All right, just keep not thinking about a white bear. You're, you're halfway through. Just don't think about a white bear. Ten more seconds. No thinking about white bears. Eight, seven, six, five, no white bears. Four, three. Two, one. All right. Anybody successful? <laughs> did you manage not to think of a white bear? Ooh, you're in the club. Good job. How did you do it? You thought of Minecraft instead? Okay. And there are no white bears in that. There's some wolves, but no white bears, right? Okay, good. What did you do? How did you? Instead. You thought of what instead? Unicorns. Unicorns. Well, there you go. Yeah. Can you? Do you think you could pull that off for a full thirty minutes? Your brother thought about a white bear six times. Yeah, that would be me. You know what? They did an actual experiment of this, where they divided people into two groups, and they told uh, they told half of them, "Don't think about a white bear." But every time you do, press the, press the buzzer. And the other half, they said, just think about a white bear. And every time you do, press the buzzer. And you know what happened? They all pressed the buzzer the same amount of times. 
our minds are hard to train. It's hard to make ourselves think about the things we want to think about and not think about the things we don't want to think about. But you all have in, uncovered an important strategy, I think. So those of you who, who managed to pull this off, it's not just about mindlessness that Paul is urging his followers to adopt, right? He doesn't just want us to empty our minds completely of everything. It's a particular frame of mind. It's a particular focus of mind. He wants us to fill our minds with something, and that's exactly what some of you did, so that when distractions come and opponents come in, we can carry on in the way that we want to. And so he says at the beginning of our passage today, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Let the same mind that be in you that was in Christ Jesus. In other words, occupy your mind with the things that would occupy the mind of Christ. And in this, the Greek sense of this word, the mind is, the, is, the, is your whole frame of reference for life. It's, the, it's, it's how you set, set the tone for your actions and your whole orientation for living. There's no way out of the wilderness, only through. And the way you get through is by taking on the mind of Christ. But seriously, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, how could the wondrous and dangerous overgrown wilderness that is the modern Western mind be cultivated into anything that looks like that of Christ? Richard Rohr does well in describing some of the conundrums. He writes, yes, the mind can think great thoughts, but also bad and limiting ones. The mind can be a gift and a curse. Yes, the mind is brilliant, but the more we observe it, the more we see it is also obsessive and repetitive. Yes, the mind seeks the truth, but it can also create lies. Yes, the mind likes to think, but until it learns to listen to others, to the body, to the heart, and all the senses, it also uses itself to block everything it does not like to do or to acknowledge. You can consider how the mind of Christ squares up against ours as Paul elaborates in this hymn that makes up the rest of our reading for today. The mind of Christ is non-exploitative. It is not grasping for or clinging to advantage. Whereas our minds tend to search for an angle we can leverage. The, Christ, the mind of Christ is self-emptying, whereas our minds tend to be rather full of, well, ourselves. The Christ mind seeks to always be of service, whereas our minds tend to steer towards self-preservation. The mind of Christ is unwaveringly humble, whereas our minds tend to slalom between self-promotion and self-degradation. Oh, you're so clever to have remembered that little anecdote about Tolstoy. They're going to love that. That's great. Good for you. <laughs> Didn't he write Anna Karenina? Did you ever read that? Oh, that's right, you started, but you didn't finish. <laughs> How many times have we talked about time management? The Christ mind is obedient, even unto death, whereas I, our minds are often seem to be allergic to considering our own mortality. So how on earth do we attain the mind of Christ? Well, the answer is not easy, but it is simple. And the kids have already demonstrated it. We make a habit of handing our minds over to him. And that means, I think, my friends, praying as Jesus did, which is most often in solitude and in silence. Minds don't like to be without a job, so this will take some practice. But the more we become intentional in turning away from the parade of distractions and attractions vying for our attention, Centering our awareness on Jesus' presence, the more natural it will become. It's not that Jesus didn't believe in public prayer. Certainly he did, but he had a lot of warnings about it as well. And so this time of, of silence, of, 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 of meaningful and intentional abiding in God's presence and letting our minds uh, be released into his care and keeping is important too. Because what happens is then the very incarnation begins to occupy our minds. 
our mind space. For Jesus didn't just come to show us the way when he was born in human likeness, but to travel it with us. And he knows, because of that, he knows what it's like to carry a full mental load of human experience. As eloquently expressed in a Palm Sunday sermon delivered by Howard Thurman in 1976, he said, I wonder what was at work in the mind of Jesus of Nazareth as he jogged along on the back of that faithful donkey. Perhaps his mind was far away to the scenes of his childhood, feeling the sawdust between his toes in his father's shop. He may have been remembering the high holy days in the synagogue with his whole body quickened by the echo of the ram's horn. Or perhaps he was thinking of his mother, how deeply he loved her and how he wished that there had not been laid upon him this great necessity that sent him out on the open road to proclaim the truth leaving her side forever. It may be that he lived all over again that high moment on the Sabbath when he was handed the scroll and he unrolled it to the great passage from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. I wonder what was moving through the mind of the master as he jogged along on the back of that faithful donkey. I feel certain that we, too, my friends, were on his mind as he passed through that narrow gate, first through the passage of human birth and then through the silence of earthly death, all to claim us as his own, heart, soul, and mind. Jesus knew what goes on in our minds, what goes through their minds and how they tend to wander but he also knows how to mold them and how to meld them with his own. So I invite you, dear ones, to take some time in these last few days of Lent to give up your minds and allow him to make of us a community with the same mind as Christ. Amen. Please stand.
seated for a moment. At this time, I'd like to invite forward the families who are preparing these last four or five weeks uh, to become members of our congregation. Please come forward now. Uh, and bring a hymn book with you or grab one on the way. That'll work too. The rest of the congregation, I invite you to open up to 234 at the front of your hymn book. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for these sisters and brothers whom you have made your own by the water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourselves and enlightened them with the gifts of your spirit and nourished them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants in the gifts and the promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. At this point, I'll invite the whole congregation uh, to join in with the profession of faith. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? I Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I ask you now, who are joining our congregation, you have made public profession of your faith do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and to share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, and to serve all people, following the example of Jesus and striving for justice and peace in all the earth? If so, please respond, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. I ask you to turn and face the congregation. People of God, do you promise to support, support these sisters and brothers and pray for them in their life in Christ? Then let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, through water and the Holy Spirit, that you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Amen. Let us rejoice with these sisters and brothers in Christ. We rejoice with you in the baptism. Together we give thanks to the praise of God and pray in the good news of all the world. Let's give them the big welcome. I'll come around to this side so they can still see you guys. Uh, and uh, I have Donald here to help me, uh, but uh, first I'm going to give this to Gail and Holly Bowling. Let's give a welcome to them. <laughs> Next we have Randy and Carrie Colvard. <laughs> we have our own Susan Day. 
And we have Bob, Bob and Judy Witt and their precious dog, Casey. <laughs> Now, uh, normally, uh, uh, I have two things. One is for you folks to use the fellowship afterwards uh, to say hello, to totally overwhelm them so they can't believe that there are so many people here at this church. Uh, but secondly, to recognize, uh, usually I, I challenge you guys to be active, and you already in. Holly, you were like leading the bell choir in uh, for this, and Susan, you were in the back making sure there was no feedback from it. Uh, so from front to back, uh, we are very proud uh, to have you as part of this community. So thank you very much, and God bless you. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's peace with your neighbors. Our worship continues with our gifts towards the ministry of God.
will join in hymn number 481. Come to the table. Please rise. It is a joy for us to gather together to celebrate uh, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given for us. And we want to welcome all to join us today uh, in this beautiful meal. Uh, there are, for those who choose, uh, the, the packets, uh, and they are available in the back. Raise your hands, and I think some of our ushers can bring you one if you need one. Uh, you are invited to take these as we have during the pandemic. And hold up the bread during the words of institution and receive them at that time. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, you are invited to come forward when the ushers uh, signal you to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then for everyone, uh, whether you've received it in the pews or come forward then, uh, there's, uh, the altar railings will be available. Pastor Kristen and I would be honored to pray with you, but you are also can use the railing for private prayer time as well. Taste and see, the Lord is good. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You called your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of grace. And so with your church on earth and all creation, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy,
In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Blessed Jesus, in this feast of grace, you have fed us with the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. We are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. The blessings of God Almighty, the grace of Christ Jesus, the light of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
let us all go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. How's everything going? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were my husband. Stand in for Oh, uh-huh.